Well, welcome everybody as you start coming in. My name is Arno Zimmern, together with Sophia Richardson and E. Mariah Spencer. We're so delighted to have you all here um, for this inaugural but somewhat experimental uh, first online OLEO webinar put on by the International Margaret Cavendish Society. Um, we have with us today Diana Applebaum and Brian Ogilvie, who are going to be speaking on a panel along with me about Cavendish, Marion, and the Order of Insects. Uh, we're, we're absolutely delighted that you're here. We want to let you know just a few things before we get started. One of them is to um, look into the chat where you'll see that um, Mariah has left a little note or comment for everybody about how to use the chat, what we're hoping that'll be used for, um, but also just generally about protocol during this, uh, this presentation. We just wanted, in case everybody's not on the same page with regards to, to Zoom, we just wanted a little um, debrief. So if you if you check your your participants or manage participants box, it'll bring you up to a little panel that that offers these different features. We want to say um, in the in the order of today's proceedings, if you have a new question or a new line of inquiry, um, do use the raise hand feature at any point. And we have a dedicated moderator in the person of Sophia who's going to be checking those out and we'll keep keeping tabs of who is in line, who is in order for a new question. If, however, you have a follow-up thought as opposed to a brand new thread, we're going to use the thumbs up feature, which you can find other on, you know, either under the, the reactions bar, the bottom of the screen usually, or directly in that manage participants. If I or anyone else is um, speaking too fast, um, and, and we understand, of course, that many of us are joining from very far away with very different time zones. It could be three o'clock in the morning where you are, and we apologize for that. Um, but also, English may not be your first language. So if you need anyone to slow down by no means be embarrassed or troubled to, to use the go slower feature. And Sophia or E will, will bluster in, or I will jump in to, to tell that person or whoever's speaking at that point to, to take it a little slower. And of course, if you're, if you're delighted with what you're hearing, if somebody has said something absolutely riveting, jolly good, well said, do use uh, the applause feature as much as you like. Um, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. The chat feature, as you'll see in E's comments below, are for a variety of uses, but um, in the interest of making this also a, a, a kind of friendly venue for everybody to continue to just live as human beings and meet as a, as a Cavendish society. Um, say you're a younger scholar and you've been trying to bug that one senior scholar for quite a, a time, no pun intended. Um, feel free to use the chat feature as a way to, to bypass their busy inbox and get to them directly and ask that question. Obviously, um, this is the moment, right? So um, we, we fully expect you to use the chat feature as, as you would any other chat feature. But just to give you a sense of the timeline for today, we're gonna to start with um, the panel itself. Then uh, after the three of us have kind of given short 10 or 12 minute presentations, we'll introduce breakout rooms. I'll hand it over to Sophia to, to handle that. And she'll explain a little bit about what the breakout rooms are for. We'll take um, that time for about 20 minutes. That'll bring us about to the hour at which point we'll take a little coffee break, bio break, doodling interlude, play soft music or something. And then we'll come back for the new hour and uh, begin a large group discussion with just everybody on the screen together if possible. Um, and at the end of our, our two hour time, we'll, we'll take it in for a wrap up. So hopefully that sounds good. Um, and if you have at any point, any technological trouble whatsoever, do feel free to check in with any of our moderators, Sophia, Mariah, and also during the breakout session, we're really grateful for Martine Van Elk, who's gonna be helping us out um, as well. So without any further ado, um, I'm gonna start with the panelists, um, a brief set of introductions. Brian Ogilvy, Professor Brian Ogilvy is Professor of History and Chair of the Department at UMass Amherst. He is currently working on two book projects, count them. Nature's Bible is the first one with subtitle, Insects in European Art, Science and Religion from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment. And his second book is uh, the, titled after the, uh, the password to this session, Butterfly, for the animal uh, series from Reaction Books. Uh, I'm kidding that he did not get the inspiration from the password, but close enough. He has published several articles and chapters on early modern science and historiography. And together with Bridget Marshall, he's also written on a case of witchcraft in 17th century Hadley, Massachusetts, the town where he lives. His broader scholarly interests include the history of scholarship, witchcraft, belief, and persecution, as well as the history of religion. He's involved also in a Leverhulme Trust International Research Network on the scientific career of Francis Willoughby, 
who was a naturalist that Cavendish would probably have known through her attested reading of John Wilkins's book, The Universal Character, where Willoughby is discreetly also published. So Brian, at this point, do you wanna um, go ahead and take over the screen sharing and, uh, and begin your presentation? Sure, that sounds like a great idea. <clears throat> uh... All right, uh, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Let me just open up the participant window so I can see any reactions um, insofar as that's possible. My screen's a little crowded. So my goals in, in, in these introductory remarks um, are to set the broader scene, uh, since I think Arno and uh, Diana will be focusing in uh, more closely uh, on their texts, uh, to briefly discuss how uh, in the period we're looking at, insect was a new and not yet stable category uh, for classifying the natural world. Uh, and finally, uh, to situate Marion's interest in metamorphosis. So let me see here. Hopefully this will work. Yep. Um, in 1592, the young Jakob Hufnachel published a collection of engravings under the title uh, Models and Studies by my father, Joris Hufnachel. Um, and I want to take a look at one of those engravings. Um, we see a moth at repose surrounded by several other insects, four plants, a snail, and a small seahorse. A Latin motto at the top uh, reads, to vary things is the ornament of the world. This is the glory of the great artificer. A further distich at the bottom emphasizes that point. All that the eternal author founded with the word celebrates the author's name and echoes praises. Now, this is clearly meant to be taken emblematically, a combination of motto, image, and explanation that conveys wisdom in pithy form. The copy in the uh, Strasbourg University Library has been bound into a volume, and we can see the page to which it's tipped has writing on it. If we flip the engraving over, uh, we see someone writing in an 18th century hand, has noted Latin names. In some cases, the identification is tentative, chrysomel, or a bug. And one annotation is judgmental, crane fly, badly drawn. The annotations do into include transcriptions of the Latin uh, poetry, but it seems as if the author was primarily interested in Hufnagel's engraving as a work of natural history, not as a, a moral teaching. There's a twist to the story though. This particular copy of Hufnagel's 1592 series was printed by the Nuremberg printer, Christoph Weigel, who owned the original copper plates sometime early in the 18th century, not long before these annotations were written. Indeed, Hufnagel's work had a long life, not only in reprints, but also uh, in copies, uh, as on the title page of John Johnston's History of Insects and Serpents, published in 1653 by the Marion brothers, Matthäus the Younger and Kaspar, who were heirs to their father's printing firm. Their half-sister, Maria Zabilla, must have seen the illustrations from this book, which may have inspired her own investigations of insects, begun in 1660 when she was 13 years old. Insect at the period though, was not yet fully established as a category for thinking about the world. And you may have noticed this uh, in the excerpts that Arno gave us from Cavendish. Uh, in uh, uh, one of the texts she referred to these birds, which man calls bees. Um, in this, she was following a long established tradition. Late medieval and early modern Europeans knew many different kinds of insects, of course. Vernacular translations of the Hortus Sanitatus a 1491 publication with its roots in the 13th and 14th centuries, lists approximately 50 kinds from ants and caterpillars to fleas, lice, and moths. However, through the latter part of the 16th century, these creatures were not grouped together in a single category of insects. The term existed. It had been coined in Greek, entomon by Aristotle, and translated into Latin by the elder Pliny as insectum but it was a technical term that was rarely used even by writers on natural history, just like today people don't in ordinary speech talk about annelids. Instead, the creatures that we call insects were referred to other kinds of animals, what folk biologists call life forms. In the Hortus and its translations, for instance, they're often called worms. We see bombex is a worm that spins silk, the cicada is a worm of the earth, and ants or pismires be very little worms and they be very wise. Um, they're also referred to as beasts. The hayspringer is a beast with four feet having a great head. Someone wasn't counting very carefully. Um, Scorpio is a beast seemingly humble. Uh, and occasionally uh, we see uh, multiple forms. Cantarides be little beasts and worms. And rarely, like Cavendish, uh, they're placed in the category of birds. Um, 
In the Latin, French, and German texts, the bee is simply an animal, but in English, the translator Lawrence Andrews has deviated from that, saying the bee is a little bird, it hath both wings, feet, and teeth. Um, as a technical term, insect received new life with the humanists' interests in Pliny the Elder, but the authors of 16th century Latin uh, vernacular dictionaries had to explain what this term meant, and they reached for those categories of worm, beast, and bird. Uh, Sir Thomas Eliot in 1538 defined insecta as all flies and worms that be divided in their bodies, the head and breast from the belly and tail, as bees, wasps, emmets, or pismires, and such like. But later in the century, the word began to enter vernacular use, and I'll limit myself to English in the interest of time. John Maplet referred in 1567 to those small and silly worms who have imperfections in their nature, uh, which by Latin word are called insecta. A decade later, Raphael Hollenshed uh, referred to the cut wasted, for so I English the word insecta are the hornets, wasps, bees, and such like, whereof we have great store. Um, by the time Philemon Holland tra translated Pliny in English in 1601, he could, felt he could use the word insects without any gloss, but the word was still not fully established. Sir William Cornwallis, in an essay published in the same year as Holland's Pliny translation, uh, stuck with the Latin, referring to ants as a silly creature made by nature without candlelight, imperfect, among those whom the philosophers call insecta animalia. The double character of the word insect, referring to both a new natural kind and to a scientific taxon, would remain with it into the present. It slowly became a natural kind in other European languages as well, and we can see that in book title pages and even in their typography. Uh, Thomas Moffat's Theater of Insects, finally published in 1634 after a long uh, afterlife, uh, glossed insecta as minima animalia. So even in Latin, he felt he had to offer uh, a gloss of what the term meant. Uh, later in the 17th century, Jans Farmerdam's Historia Insectorum Generalis used the Dutch bloedelose diepkens, uh, blood, bloodless uh, little creatures, to translate uh, insectum. By the 18th century, though, the term was finally established. Uh, and we can even see uh, the process uh, of uh, naturalization in the title pages of German books. Uh, on the left, we have um, uh, Johann Leonhard Frisch's uh, description of all kinds of insects in Germany, a bit of an exaggeration in that title, which uses Roman type for insect, indicating it's still considered to be a foreign term. Uh, by, by the 1740s, it appears in black letter, for instance, uh, in August Johann Rösel von Rosenhoff's uh, or monthly insect entertainment. Um, now, why were people, yeah, insect entertainment, you know, they didn't have television in those days. Uh, why were people interested in insects? It was in part their beauty and their position on the edges of perception, just large enough to see, uh, but difficult to see clearly and thus to represent clearly, as we see here in this uh, imitation of Durer by Hufnagel, uh, where Hufnagel goes uh, one farther on Durer in portraying in great detail the stag beetle. Um, insects also had the advantage of having short lifespans in a period when many Europeans were interested in uncovering the secrets of generation, or as we would say, reproduction. Uh, from antiquity through the 16th century, it was widely believed that insects resulted from spontaneous generation. Uh, Cavendish reflects this point of view in her text uh, of a butcher and a fly. Um, so what we think of as the life cycle of one creature was generally conceptualized as the death of one and the rebirth out of its corruption of a new creature. Um, this cycle gave insects a peculiar emblematic status. On the one hand, Hufnagel used the stag beetle's generation to proclaim its origins. I am neither begotten by a male nor conceived by a female. The author, that is God himself, is my creator and seed. On the other hand, the earliest illustration I found of insect metamorphosis, also by Hufnagel, emphasizes birth, suffering, and death as the lot of all living beings. And this association of insects with decay, as well as their beauty, gave them a paradoxical fascination. In the 1650s and 1660s, a number of people came to an interest apparently independently of one another in the exact nature of insect generation. In Cambridge, the naturalist John Ray and his friend and former pupil, Francis Willoughby, had been fascinated by caterpillars that gave birth to small flies or wasps. Ray mentioned the phenomenon in passing in a 1660 catalog of plants growing near Cambridge. And the following year, Willoughby's short paper on the subject was read to the new Royal Society, though not published. In Middelburg in the Netherlands, 
the Dutch landscape artist Johannes Goudak was collecting insects, raising them in jars, and studying their transformations. He published these observations in three volumes, the last one posthumous, between 1660 and 1669. And in Frankfurt in 1660, as I've mentioned before, the 13-year-old Maria Isabella Marion began her observations of insects with silkworms metamorphoses. Um, by the time naturalists uh, like Johannes Swammerdam, uh, Francesco Redi, and Marcello Malpighi turned their in attention to insect generation in the 1660s, they could just, thus draw upon the work of at least some of these artists, um, Hudart's publications, um, uh, even though Willoughby's observations remain unpublished and Marion's would be printed only beginning in 1679. Um, so I hope in this very brief overview to have shown you that insects are a new, unstable, label category. Some people are thinking in terms of insects, others are still thinking them as little birds, little beasts, or little worms. And there's this new interest in uh, their generation uh, and metamorphosis uh, into which we can situate uh, both Marion's investigation of insects uh, of Europe and of Suriname uh, and uh, Cavendish's reflections on them. Uh, so uh, thank you for your attention and I'll now uh, Stop screen sharing and hand the floor over. I'm going to take back over the screen just to introduce our next speaker, Diana Applebaum, who is um, assistant professor and director of the academic writing program at Marymount Manhattan College. Her scholarship is interdisciplinary, bridging the history of science, early American studies, and writing and rhetoric. By reading transatlantic women's varied participation in the global project of natural history as a generic practice, her current book project entitled Empire and Ecology with the subtitle Gender and Place in Women's Natural Histories of the Americas from 1688 to 1808. This book project argues for a remapping of the natural history genre's historiography. Diana has a forthcoming essay on Maria Sibylla Marion in the anthology Transatlantic 18th Century Women Travelers edited by Mesty Kruger, which you can pre-order uh, or suggest to your libraries, should you so wish. Sorry, Diane, I really had to do that shameless plug. Um, but would you like to unmute yourself and take over the screen? Sure. Okay, let me see if I can get the images up. Everybody sees that image? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, as Brian said, my uh, contribution today is gonna be a little bit more uh, close reading oriented. Uh, so I wanted to thank everybody uh, who's here for organizing this. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk through our work and also to uh, really closely read together. Um, so the essay that Arnaud just mentioned that's going to be published in that essay, um, which some of this today is excer excerpted from, I explore the many tensions in Marion's metamorphosis of the insects of Insects of Suriname, published in 1705, after Marion and daughter Dorothea's expedition to Suriname from 1699 to 1701. So to name some of these tensions, a desire to depict Suriname as place, its local environments, its insects and their life cycles in symbiotic relation with their food sources, and at the same time, a desire to circulate this knowledge globally, to make a mark as woman naturalist, artist, and traveler in the, in the enterprise of natural history and in scientific discourses on metamorphosis. This same tension can be imagined as the protoecologic impulse of her plates and text in the larger context of colonial violence colonial violence, which the perfectibility in insect metamorphosis and in the artistic composition of the plates both says nothing about and simultaneously says everything about. There are also the many layers of observation and descriptive practice, as well as considerations of genre that complicate these tensions. So my paper is centrally concerned with Marion's emphasis on reproduction in a place of deadly consumption. In a Suriname where by the end of the 18th century, according to Richard and Sally Price, quote, the ratio of Africans to Europeans was more than 25 to one and as high as 65 to one in the plantation districts, end quote. Marion's insects represent the dual forces of reproduction and consumption at the core, not just of Suriname as place, but of the colonial encounter and of course of colonial natural history. Her insects make these tensions come alive. So I'd like to take you now through a couple of close readings of the plates that I shared with you. Um, and I hope we can do a little bit more of this today. Um, I've up also updated the translations in the document in the Dropbox. And um, as you, we look at these images, it would be great if you could kind of track your eyes across the images as we closely read them. 
Um, and a note too, as Brian said in his materials, these are counterproof. So any mention that I make of direction is based on the colored image that you actually see before you. So in the very first plate of Marianne's opulent, the metamorphosis of the insects of Suriname, cockroaches hover over a prickly pineapple in bloom. Beginning with the glorious pineapple sent a clear message to Marianne's subscribers. This volume would be matchless, sumptuous. As readers were infected by the cockroach's appetite for this sweet fruit, an exotic rarity that few but royalty had then seen or tasted. The beautiful description of the leaves as quote, long outside a light sea green and within like a green prairie with reddish edges and filled with enough sharp thorns, end quote, heightens our sensory experience of the plate. Marion's cockroaches are central in the composition, drawing our attention through their carefully directed antennas to the pineapple, steering the composition to the center by pulling to the right and balancing the left-leaning pineapple, and finally by enclosing as though in an oval frame the fruit itself. In the accompanying textual description, cockroaches are agents gnawing, casting seeds, eating through the hull and destroying. As with all of her plates, Marion is centrally concerned here with reproduction. How the cockroaches hatch, morph, slough off skin, inhabit or empty their sacs, exit and enter private spaces, and of course, raid and eat the pineapple is of prime fascination. In the case of the cockroaches, reproduction and consumption proliferate causally. In order to reproduce, they must first consume. Consumption is balanced by a parallel strain of sustainability, wherein Marion pairs that believed to be the most attractive with that believed to be the most repulsive in environmental interdependence. This pairing strategically highlights the beauty of the insects she so admired and suggests that if we look closely, what we see in God's handiwork is a mirror of human life. Beginning with the familiar and revered pineapple and relying on, quote, the learned men who have spoken strongly on this fruit, end quote, Marion impresses Europe onto Suriname, reinforcing imperialist modes of knowledge production. And yet her own science and marvelously ecosystemically driven art proceeds to reject those modes by purporting to depict the insects and plants and habitat specific interrelation with their local food sources. The language Marion employs to describe the cockroaches, their entries and departures, their relentless motion reflects the evolving genre of natural history. The very way Marion frames this plate, the revelation of the celebrated pineapple as it blooms accompanied by two species of cockroaches, one metamorphosing, implies her own commitment to glorifying and revolutionizing the genre all in one. One way in which she does the latter is by complicated complicating the provocative imperialist trope of feminized nature conquered and subsequently defiled. The cockroaches are on the verge of fulfilling their instinctual needs, here their love for sweet things, the result of which the devouring of the pineapple, which is not pictured, is a natural if invasive process. While the genre's own role in colonial conquests and the observer naturalists might be metaphorically represented here, the plate's function is to create the illusion of ecosystemic balance. The cockroaches and pineapple illustrate the unaltered continuance of environmental processes with both consumption and reproduction at work. Even as analogously, the naturalist documentation of this scene is consumptive and its dissemination is reproductive. Harnessing the familiar imperialist emblem of the pineapple to frame a volume deeply invested in representations of local ecologies exemplifies the contradictory impulses of Marion's work, local re relations and global circulation. So I'll just take you through one more plate. We'll do this one, plate 18, which I'm sure you've seen before as it's probably her most heavily circulated plate. Um, in Marianne's frequently reproduced and highly active plate 18, her staging is apparent. Where hummingbirds typically lay two eggs, Marianne depicts four. Where leaf cutting and army ants move in separate circles, here they are represented together. The extraordinary Goliath bird-eating tarantula, identified as the largest spider species in the world by Henry Walter Bates in his 1863 work, The Naturalist on the River Amazons, is in the act of devouring a prostrate, carefully positioned hummingbird. The perfect guava fruit and the proportional egg-like abdomens and heads of the spiders are juxtaposed against crisp lines, the gangly limbs of the spiders and tree branches and falling munched on leaves. A great deal is happening here as the large spider on the right pinches a tiny ant. The spider on the left consumes that still exquisitely colorful dead hummingbird. Marauding ants make a bridge from limb to limb of the tree and a smaller spider captures an ant in its web. 
The composition itself is a complex web representing life and death at work and conveying Marion's sentiment that, quote, the ants are always at war with the spiders and insects of this country, end quote. The language of war or here of predation among Surinamese insects is not bemoaned. Rather, ants, quote, armed with curved teeth, end quote, are part of this web of life. The rounded, slightly oval guava fruits form an imperfect, left-tilted circular frame with the egg-shaped abdomens of the three large spiders on the upper left, lower left, and middle right. The four tiny hummingbird eggs in the nest above the lower guava fruit complete this frame. The ant wing color matches that of the guava fruit. The proportionality and magnification of this plate are astonishing. The upper left quadrant appears more distant, and as the webs the spiders have woven ripple out, so too does the plate zoom in on the two larger spiders, the guava fruit, the dead hummingbird, and the stalk of the tree. Processes of predation and death are integral to Marion's preservationist vision here. After all, the plate's paradoxical conceit is that this ecosystem is violently alive because it is unspoiled by human interference. Marion's textual description follows the same circular framework, beginning with the spiders, moving to the ants, then back to the spiders, and finally to the hummingbird. Her uh, description of the ants echoes that of Plate One's cockroaches, entreating us to see her project as a unified representation of a larger, highly intricate network of life processes. Quote, they come out from their caves in countless swarms. Men are obliged to flee as they enter room by room by troops. Hummingbirds, for their part, part are, mar are compared to marvel-inducing peacocks, and of prime importance is the mutually sustaining food reliance of insects on the plate, as well as of humans and animals outside the plate, including Suriname hens, which eat ant eggs, and priests, human priests, who, like spiders, relish the hummingbird for its meat. Her complex integration of humans within this scene works on two planes. It both registers a colonial present presence and suggests a profoundly transformative human nature alliance that sees humans and spiders competing for one food source. Her insects are sentient actors, for they make bridges, bite, make war, hibernate, attack, devour, terrify, and even manifest the illusion of winter. The ants dig underground caves, quote, as well as men might do, end quote. The use of anthropomorphism, analogy, and metaphor techniques used by imperial naturalists that are employed descriptively here plant the reader into the scene of predation in medias race. The reader viewer experiences this scene as an observer from the outside and as a participant from the inside. This dynamic tableau and its description render Marion too as naturalist illustrator and alongside her reader, both invisible and invasive in the habitat. Marion's overarching claim to illustrations from life certainly the sentiment in this remarkable plate, also acknowledges multiple other levels of the naturalist's intrusion from the practice of staging plates to that of basing foundational knowledge on human flora fauna analogy. At the same time, Marion's symbiotic focus, her quote, time lapse of life cycles, as Kay Etheridge calls it, and the giant folio-sized plates that allow for a full observational and sensory experience of a plate like this one, Literary, literally and symbolically magnify what Dana Phillips in The Truth of Ecology calls an ecologic point of view. Plate 18 seems to say that nature should operate unimpeded, and yet the audience can I witness almost as nearly as the naturalist herself does from home. The spiders, Marian Chronicles, have already traveled globally, even as the home viewer looks upon a dynamic ecosystem that ironically appears undisturbed. Plate 18, the most complex and frequently replicated of her images, exceptional even for the metamorphosis, embodies the narrative of Marion's exemplarity as female naturalist, a marker of gender difference. Remarkably, Marion engages the male tradition of sexualizing nature through the parted leaf lips of the oval guava fruit, as well as through the labial falling leaves, their lip shape, if we turn the plate horizontally. The falling of these leaves toward the nest of hummingbird eggs is not accidental, neither is it a coincidence that some of her ants are winged or breeding. Reproduction, not death, is primary. Marion's preoccupation with Suriname's reproductive potential not only suggests a desire to privilege self-sustaining local ecologies, but also acknowledges the consumptive forces of empire, without which she could not have traveled, collected specimens, composed or circulated her natural history, and from which local reproduction, with an emphasis on insects depicted in her art in all its beauty and brutality, cannot be disentangled. Thank you. Thanks.
Fantastic, Diana. Again, everybody, please, yeah, throw your hands up. Last and least, um, yours truly is a postdoctoral fellow <laughs> at the Navari Family Center for Digital Scholarship, which is literally this room, um, at the Hesburgh Libraries of Notre Dame, as well as a research fellow for um, the Center for Technology Ethics. My main focus is early modern French and English literature, um, as it reveals the history of panaceas and, uh, and the narratives of medical progress that we've inherited from the 17th century. But I do have broad interests in religion, science and literature, women's writing, and, and obviously bugs. Um, you can find some of my stuff forthcoming in, in three or four years whenever editors get back up with uh, the train, but you, John Dunn Journal and places like that. So let me share my screen with you and, and round off our series of presentations. So the, the, the efforts of Margaret Cavendish's contemporaries to live with insects, especially in England, ranged from the luxurious all the way to the homespun, right? So John Evelyn and, and Christopher Wren designed transparent glass beehives, which you can see on the left there, complete with extravagant weather vanes and statuettes fit for a queen bee. By contrast, Samuel Hartlib advised keeping silkwork, silkworm eggs in your bed Question mark between between two warm pillows until such time as the worms begin to come forth. Um, creepy, but these of course, are the methods of aristocratic scientists and would be profit makers. How then did less Baconian observers garner meaning and moral value, not just profit and profitable knowledge from interacting with insects? I think ah. his writings are a great and perhaps an underused res resource for that question. And Sylvia Bowerbank, a notable cabinet scholar, pointed us in a great direction when she noted that the observation of insects was a well-established part of the curriculum for children. In Aesop's fables and other allegories, personifications of ants, bees, and drones, the, the male bee, teach standards of thrift and industry. Spiders and silkworms uh, exemplify divisions of domestic and gendered labor. And caterpillars and butterflies model spiritual conversion, right? the decay of the old, the birth of the new. Even when they weren't or aren't moral allegories and exempla, insects still teach infants and philosophers alike to auscult with patience, to move at nature's pace and with its rhythms, to inspect and then respect smaller, weaker, sometimes also harmful creatures. One 18th century female writer warned that if a mother fails to teach her children about the contributions of insects, a son will grow up to make it his sport to torment and destroy, while a daughter, you can sense the gendering here, will grow up affecting terror at the sight of an insect she esteems deformed. So in brief, the appreciation of insects was really a matter of civilizational as well as psychological, imaginative and ethical development. And as Cavendish realized in composing her insect fables, the genre itself, though increasingly devoted to children and perhaps scribbled upon by children, was never just for children. Now the Duchess of, Ca of Newcastle, uh, of course, was delighted rather than squeamish at the thought of and sight of insects, uh, especially insects in their multitudes. Their infinite numbers, shapes, sizes, and behaviors confirmed what she believed most firmly about nature, namely that it is truly infinite and far surpasses the compass of human minds. As many of us in the room have come to appreciate, whenever Cavendish finds a topic that's really too big to, you know, for the compass of human minds, she likes to study it from many angles and through multiple genres, whether it's fables, poems, observations, letters, utopia, farce, or philosophy, Cavendish wrote about insects in nearly all of them. So although she likely did not fashion uh, glass beehives or keep silkworms in her pillows, she does join her aristocratic contemporaries in pursuing a range of methods from the elite considerations of natural philosophy to the more homespun genre of the fable. Regarding natural philosophy, we know that Cavendish composed precise rebuttals to the claims of Robert Hooke's micrographia about the 14,000 eyes of flies and their remarkable claws and talons. One key conceptual struggle in those writings involves reconciling two ill-matched principles. Nature, on the one hand, is infinitely fanciful and whimsical, and nature, on the other hand, is infinitely intentional and meticulous in its designs. Everything must be for a purpose, and yet not everything seems to be as efficient or as self-evident as it could be. Why then have 14,000 eyes if they're no good, she asks in her, in her reflections. That tension plays out in her observations of flies, in the teeth of snails and leeches, and the life cycle of butterflies, and they go on to provide 
a memorable scene in her utopian fiction, The Blazing World, where we learn that the imperial race stays eternally youthful despite reaching centennial ages like 400 or 300 years, thanks to a kind of purgative metamorphosis that Cavendish clearly models after what she knows and intuits about caterpillars and chrysalises. And if you want the juicy details, do go ahead and take a, a screenshot there or, or find that page number. It is gory. An intellectual historian might go deeper by tracing who Cavendish read, what challenges she encountered, what theories she preempted, and what contributions she made. There are tentative answers to that question, and I'm always tickled to think that the geriatric physician, Dr. John Smith, may have borrowed a leaf from the blazing world when he proposed in 1676 that since there are insects which enjoy several transformations and renovations, like metamorphoses, why may not some such thing as this, or at least something analogous, be wrought upon man? But be that as it may, intellectual history may not be the most secure way to get at the spark of Cavendish's early interest in the lives of insects. A better resource might be the fables enclosed in the 1655 Nature's Picture or the poems in Poems and Fancies. Though those fables are more often read as political commentary, they, speak, they bespeak Cavendish's effort to do natural history her own way and to do also a kind of ecological ethics her own way as well. In her fables, we find Cavendish intent on giving insects a microphone rather than putting them under a microscope. The fables are imbued not only with descriptive or taxonomical interests appropriate to natural history, like biological behaviors, architectural principles, anatomies, both of individuals and of collectives and swarms, but they're also imbued with genuine ethical quandaries. The insects seem to apologize in the, in the classical sense of the term for the way that they conduct their lives and interact with others. They prove particularly adept at complicating the line dividing innocence from cruelty. It's not always clear at the end of a Cavendish fable what constitutes harm and what constitutes reparation in nature's court of law. Her fables strike a delicate balance of biology and apologetics, and they blunt or perhaps blur the traditionally clear cut moralizing tone of the fable genre. My hope is to hear us all talk about maybe that aspect um, in more detail in our discussion, but I'd like not to taint our readings of the fables too much. So let me close instead by drawing a contrast between Cavendish and two contemporary female poets, Jane Barker and Catherine Phillips. The tendency in Barker and Phillips when they write about insects is to use them as similes to frame their own apologies. Jane Barker, for instance, pens a panegyric po uh, poem to a benefactor, Mr. E.S.T., apologizing for what she calls her own babbling rhymes. Babbling, of course, they are not. The poem ends with a simile that's both modest in content, but marvelous in technique. She addresses Mr. E directly saying, there's very few like you that do possess the stoic strictness and the poet's gentleness. I much admire your worth, but more my fate that worthless I thereof participate. Even so, the sun disdains not to dispense on meanest insects his bright influence that gives them animation by his rays, which they requite, like me, with worthless praise. Now the simile of the insects in the sun is encoded in Modesty Topoi, expected of women's writing, but listeners cannot but hear the insect-like sibilance that Barker slips into nearly every line, beginning with the internal and terminal rhymes of, there's very few like you that do possess stoic strictness poet's gentleness. And that reaches a climax in the simile even so the sun disdains not to dispense on meanest insects his bright influence. Barker's verses are singing or chirping like a cicada in the sun. She elevates flattery to a form of natural history as the poem of praise to creation or to the, uh, the dedicatee gives way to a, rather a hymn of creation. Also simile seems to kind of give way to biomimicry. But all of this of course is in a bid to make her apology more artful and thereby more persuasive. Likewise, Catherine Phillips writing an apologetic poem to a female friend whom Phillips has offended uses an insect simile to downplay her poetry and to raise up her valued but estranged friend. Oh, may good heaven, but so much virtue lend to make me fit to be Lucasia's friend. But I'll forsake myself and seek a new self in her breast that's far more rich and true. Thus, the poor bee unmarked doth hum and fly and drowned with age would unregarded die unless some lucky drop of precious gum do bless the insect with an amber tomb. Then, glorious in its funeral, the bee 
gets eminence and gets eternity. Here, Phillips, like Barker, portrays herself as a negligible insect, the poor, unmarked, unregarded bee, to be saved from ignominy and anonymity only if her friend accepts her artful apology. The closing reference to Amber and the bee is very clever. Whereas male sonneteers might talk of immortalizing and enshrining their friends or their beloveds in the amber of their own poetry, Phillips turns the tables. It's the poor, unmarked, unregarded insect poet who will get eminence and who will get eternity if Lucasia agrees to take Phillips back into her amber heart. Now, Cavendish was content to use insect similes similarly. I won't deny that. Her poem, The Dialogue of Melancholy and Mirth, presents us with a, a, a personification of mirth singing that my music is the buzzing of a fly, which in the sunny beams do dance all day and harmlessly do pass their time away. That link between pastoral buzzing and harmless amateurism is akin to Barker's and typical of women's modesty topoi. But unlike her peers, Cavendish is genuinely interested in the harmfulness of insects. In one poem, she notes, that little gnats like fancies or thoughts can be easily slain, but they can also blister the thinker's head till it turns red. In another poem, she compares the painfulness of fire to the painfulness of flies stings. For when they sting the flesh, they know blood draw, but blisters raise, the skin made red, the flesh raw. In some, I think Cavendish does quite a bit more with insects and in her writings than many of her contemporaries by exploring the actual physical, literal, powerful harmfulness of insects, and by wondering from an almost neutral standpoint, although it's never quite neutral, whether she can and whether she needs to reconcile a naturalist's insectophilia with a kind of pragmatist's tendency towards maybe insectophobia, perhaps even insecticide. That's, I think, one perspective to enter into the fables, which I'll stop here. Um, and, and maybe we can get into once we've maybe broken out into breakout rooms. But before I hand it over to Sophia to introduce us to that, let's give one more round of applause to all of our panelists. And uh, boy, it's lovely to see hands go up. It actually really is heartwarming. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, welcome back, everybody. We're going to get right back in and get started. Um, I hope those breakout rooms helps everybody get at least a few questions going and, and thoughts stirred. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, for that round of applause. Uh, <laughs> we're, um, this is kind of the experimental part. Uh, and, and so I, I just want to preface by saying that if you want to raise uh, questions in the chat uh, and, and kind of start stockpiling them there, that's, that's obviously welcome. We have at least one person, um, Kei Jing, whose microphone is, is strangely not working for us. We, that was bound to happen. But um, Mariah and Sophia, I think, will be very attentive to those things. So. Um, with no particular agenda or schedule, uh, we want to just kind of open this up for a broader discussion. And uh, really the, the experts are no longer really the experts in the room. We're, we're trying to collect each other's thoughts and ideas. Um, perhaps starting maybe just for, for order's sake with some of Brian's sources, sources that Brian shared, um, questions that kind of came up around maybe those first, uh, and then we'll move towards Diana. And if Cavendish has time in the, in the final 20 minutes or just kind of starts morphing, into it, then, then that'll be ideal. But um, maybe if you can all pull those up, if you've got them in print or on your screen, um, and we can start there. I also just want to jump in to encourage people to raise your hands um, in the participants window um, if you want to be called on, you can also chime in in the chat and E will be monitoring those and interjecting periodically. And if you don't know how to raise your hand, shoot me a message and I will see if I can talk you through it. For instance, David has a hand right now. Sure, you know, I think it's a question for, any, for anyone on the panel or, or anyone in the room, but it came out of the, the breakout discussion uh, with Brian's group. Uh, Elisa had asked a question about natural theology or the attempt to uh, prove God's existence in nature through the study, of God's existence in nature through the study of the natural world. And I guess my question is that, uh, is something like this, uh, that the descriptions of these insects are so, um, 
um, the, the authors are so much in awe in many cases of the insects and they really admire the insects and think that they're wonderful. Uh, and, and so the question is, is really, uh, is there evidence that any of these folks who studied the insects uh, in the 17th century in this time period, uh, that they in, uh, flirted with atheism as a result? Um, and the idea is just this, it's that you could see these amazing sophisticated creatures and think, wow, there's gotta be a God that created them all, that's the only explanation. Or you could study these creatures and start to think, wow, uh, the natural world has so much sophistication and order within it that it's able to bring about order on its own and there doesn't need to be a God. <laughs> and, and maybe the insects are really good evidence of that. Uh, and Anna has a great point in the chat too, which is that insects could also be, you know, plagues of, of locusts, they could be punishments. Um, so, you know, is, are they evidence of God and is that a benevolent God? You know, and I, I, sh I should qualify sure that the, the insects might be you know, ruthless, they could be awful, but they, they still exhibit quite a lot of sophistication and order right, either way. And so that could be evidence that the natural world could bring about order on its own. Um, well, Brian, yeah. I could get us started just with the observation that um, the one of the reasons Johannes Swammerdam insisted so um, vociferously that God followed uh, an, an inexorable natural order that insects mated, they laid eggs, um, those eggs grew into um, larvae and then they metamorphosed into adult insects and the cycle was repeated, was to counter this idea of spontaneous generation because he was concerned about the fact that if spontaneous generation were possible, if unorganized matter were able to produce something more organized, that might call into, into question um, the truth of Christian revelation and the existence of a God. Um, you know, I'm not aware of anyone who actually made that argument uh, in the 17th century, but there were people who were afraid other people might make that argument and tried to argue against it. Uh, so that's certainly one factor. Um, Lisa, I see you raising your hand, uh, but you're muted. Hold on. Um, at the bottom, uh, the bottom left of your screen. Yeah, there you okay. go. Now you can hear me. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I think Brian's right in the 17th century, people were very afraid of the Epicurean kind of analysis that uh, would lead to atheism, that somehow all of these little atoms could get together and produce the creation, the created world, and insects. Uh, by the 18th century, uh, I think that there is much more skepticism and obviously more atheism happening. So in the Gentleman's Magazine, sometime in the mid 18th century, there's a big discussion of whether Adam and Eve had lice in their hair or whether lice came about um, when Moses and Pharaoh were arguing and it was one of the plagues. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the biblical account is idiotic. So, you know, uh, you know, as a historian, I want to see change through time, and, or I do see change through time. So I asked Brian about whether we can view insects as an umbrella term and whether we can use it as a temporal index also of, of change. So I got this. What others think? Those insects. <laughs> well, I will say that this seems to be something Cavendish is really struggling with when you look at her accounts of metamorphosis, which she's like, she says there's no such thing as metamorphosis because you can't have something change its interior intellect nature. You can, with you can't have a total exterior change without corresponding into into intellect change. And yet she doesn't really know what to make of 
sometimes then the term metamorphosis actually does slip back into her register. Um, so maybe she's a useful sort of tipping point moment where you sort of see both things happening at once. Um, who, who else wants to, wants to jump in on spontaneous maggots and things? Lisa, did you want to respond? Um, I think, uh, am I? You're unmuted. unmuted, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that she is a tipping point, Janet, and I've wondered about metamorphosis in her work also, um, certainly going back to the idea of uh, natural theology, uh, she does not primarily look at the created world as uh, a product of the divine. She thinks of it as nature being brought forth in all her glory. So uh, it might be helpful at this point to draw a contrast between Cavendish and Marianne on that point, simply because, yeah. and, and Diana jumped in on this one, um, and, and Brian as well. Marianne is, is involved uh, later in her life, or maybe in the middle of her life, I forget what point, with the Labadists um, and their kind of creative theology. Uh, it was a small, um, I think people would call it a sect or a cult today, but it, it really was trying to develop its own theology. And I don't know if it had its own natural theology to go with it, but the contrast couldn't be sharper with Cavendish, who so chronically kind of tries to leave the question of God to a large extent aside, but the, the grounds of natural philosophy is an exception. And, and if Anne Thal were here, she would okay. she would slap me on the hand firmly for saying that, that God is not in the question. But um, there is an effort, at least in the observations and certainly in the fables, to work in a kind of agnostic universe. But Dana, do you want to jump in and, and or Brian and inform us a little bit more about uh, Marion on that point? Uh, go ahead, Dana, if you yeah, want. Yeah, I don't, I don't exactly know uh, if the Labadists had their own uh, natural theology, but the Labadists were the group who brought her essentially to Suriname. She knew of Suriname or she chose Suriname because there had been an early colony, an early Labadist colony in Suriname. So. Uh, I certainly think, you know, that natural theology in the way, David, that you define it is at work in her plates that she's attempting to bring forth or, or, or show the wonder of God through the wonder of these scenes. Um, but Brian, your thoughts? Well, I, I would say, first of all, um, Anna Charlotte Trepp has argued in her book, Von der Glückseligkeit, Alles zu wissen, that Marianne actually is less engaged with natural theology in her later work than she was in the 1679 and 1683 uh, insect books, which are shot through with um, references to God um, and being able to perceive him in the creation. You know, I have not looked at whether the Labadists had a particular natural theology, but I agree with Anne Blair that um, natural theology and, and even uh, to some degree physical theology was um, transdenominational um, and even crossed the um, Catholic Protestant boundary pretty easily uh, in the 17th, late 17th and 18th century um, that you find, for instance, um, some of the ideas of the Flemish Jesuit Lessius being taken up uh, in the 18th century, both by the Lutheran Lesser and by the Calvinist Lyonnais who translates, well, who annotates um, and corrects the translation of Lesser from German into French. Uh, and so I'm sure that those ideas were circulating in that area. Uh, Swammerdam, um, who wasn't a Labadist, but for was a, a while uh, a follower of um, Antoinette Bourignon, also develops an elaborate natural theology. Um, his book on the Mayfly was, you know, a, a hefty folio in the original Dutch, uh, and when it was translated into English, it came out as a fairly slim quarto because all the natural theology was cut out by the English translator, who just wanted to know about how Mayflies reproduce. Uh, and how they act and what their anatomy is like. So, you know, I, the, the Labadist uh, period in Marianne's life was important, um, but uh, it may have had as much a negative effect on her natural theology um, uh, as a distinctive one. To jump back into David's original question, it might make sense to, um, to also point just to a, um, a recent book by, by Lisa Sedaris. Um, the, the Google link is, is below on, on wonder and science and natural theology. So this is a recent text that looks really at, at modern um, contemporary um, atheist philosophers, um, Dennett, um, Dawkins, etc., and and questions whether the wonder, the nature of awe in those uh, different 
authors is really quite the same as the awe and wonder that's talked about in kind of theological um, creation. I, I think I only sent that to Trina, excuse yeah. me, let me send that link again. Thanks for the note, Trina. Um, so um, Sedaris is really kind of quite firm that some of the awe and wonder of these later agnostic or atheist scientists is an awe and wonder at humanity's own ability to fathom the complexity of nature. It's, a, it's an awe that ultimately has its talos back in kind of human observation, as opposed to an awe and wonder that's externalized towards some sort of creator that really is awe-inspiring, whether that creator, to get back to um, it's honest question, is, is good or bad or has um, kind of anthrop anthropic, um, a kind of philanthropic um, side to it or not. Um, so I just thought I'd drop that in the question. Um, I am also conscious of Liza Blake's yeah. thoughts that, you know, maybe we need to move on to the next question and, and I'll let the, the moderators um, get us going. Thank you, Arno. Yeah, definitely. We would love to hear the conversations that were taking place in uh, Diane's and Arno's rooms. Would you like me to um, sum up a little bit, Arno, and what happened in our room? Um, Please. We had very little time. It felt like the 20 minutes, it flew by really. At some point we're looking up going, oh, three minutes left. But um, we had, let me have a look at my notes here. Um, Cecilia was very interested in um, this, uh, the, the vanitas dimension of some of the uh, sort of art that features insects and the still life genre. And um, I was thinking of that too, of the kind of the connection between, um, and this is slightly aside from what we talked about, but I'm just gonna put it in there. The idea, uh, you know, that women as pastime um, created images of insects, you know, they, they painted them on still life, they embroidered them sometimes. Um, I myself have looked at in glass engravings by Dutch women that feature insects. And so we have this sort of artistic dimension that, um, carries over into the natural history and, and related Diana has a really interesting question about visual and textual ways of knowing, how visual and textual ways of knowing may be different or similar. So we talked about that. And then we also really wanted to know more about the glass beehive. And so we talked a little bit about that. I think that's kind of, I don't know, Arno, you might want to add some to what we talked about. I definitely want to have a general conversation about that relationship between text and image. Um, and, and Diana did such an amazing job of kind of bringing out for us all of this kind of silent or unnoticeable um, traits of it. And Diana, you also have um, worked on um, the, the indigenous specialists who really helped Marianne get to the heart of some of these questions. Could you tell us just a little bit more? And then I, and then I think Tanya has a question that she also wants to raise that might be related or not be related. Maybe that ship has sailed, Tanya, I don't know. But um, Dana, do you want to get us started and then we'll bring Tanya in? Yeah, actually in our group, we just talked a little bit about those other two plates that uh, I didn't closely read in my remarks, the plate 36 and 45, which are really derailments in certain ways in her larger project because they bring in indigenous knowledge and African knowledges and they mediate the, you know, she mediates those knowledges for the European reader. There's a kind of lack of judgment in it um, that I'm reading that I think is really interesting. It's presented sort of as, you know, this is something that I heard with my own ears or that I saw with my own eyes. Um, and so I give testament to this testimony from, um, from, from these peoples. Um, and especially plate 45, which has been looked at pretty closely by some other um, early American scholars who have really been interested in uh, the kind of openness of the comment that the peacock flower is used for abortion. And specifically because enslaved peoples do not want their children to be enslaved. Uh, so very, very interesting. And then this kind of very quick move to the, to the caterpillar, right? To describing the caterpillar that she depicts on, on the plate. So yeah, so it is, those two plates I think are particularly interesting in that way and not representative of very much of the larger project, but it's still more than many male naturalists are doing in that regard. In terms of the text and image, um, I think it's very, 
very important to read them together. And that's been one of the difficulties with Marianne. One of her legacies, and we talked about this in our group too, is really been that she's an artist, you know, and really what's stayed with us is her artwork and her um, her plates. And they're often, you know, sold uh, by auction houses or displayed or curated by museums as digital collections without the accompanying text. And I definitely think that gives it is a big disservice to her because she really, really uh, saw herself at least in my research as a scientist, as somebody who was doing really important work um, with insect metamorphosis and um, observation. So those I think really need to be read together. And others like Chrissy and Nini have read, you know, have read that the text and image together emblematically. Um, and that's another really, really interesting tack to take. So Thank you so much for that, Diana. Tanya, do you want to go ahead and chime in? It's addressed to all three panelists, but maybe other people can also weigh in. And it's about the concept of categorization. Table category to begin with in the period. Um, and then Diana, of course, in, in our breakout room, we also discussed um, when a, into Luna. So and as uh, further ways, you know, is it the thing that's inside the thing that determines what category the thing belongs to? And, and Arno, I would just love to hear what people think about the end of uh, the first fable in, in the wonderful selection that you shared with us. I mean, I'm just um, you know, these is as wise and happy as the Republic Commonwealth. So, um, it's not such or such kinds of governments, but such and such rich with plenty. Uh, I'm just amazed. We've talked about how she uh, experiments with lots of different ideas, but I'm, I'm really curious that she doesn't actually care because I, I don't think it aligns with other parts of her political writing where she probably does have a you know, a bent towards a certain kind of government, but I'm just amazed that here, part of the fable is saying the kind of government doesn't matter as much as the method or the way that the governing happens. So I, I don't know who wants to jump in. Okay, I, I can. Can jump in if that's immediately. So I'll, I'll step out of her way in just a second. But just to say that the fables, um, I, I should have said this a little more clearly. Uh, they strike me as exercises in um, what rhetoricians called ad utramque partem um, debate, right? And really kind of working either side of a rhetorical debate and giving us kind of fulsome an account of each position as you can, uh, never always kind of ingenuously, um, but if she comes to a kind of reconciled position on the governments, I don't know necessarily that it reflects personal opinion at that point in history, um, more as it is like a, a kind of exercise. And so when I was thinking, and, and I, I'll shut up and, and give this over to Lisa, um, because she has so much more that she can share with us on this point, but something about the way that she does the insect fables as an exercise both of kind of biography and life writing, but also an exercise in apologetics for what someone has done that might be twisted or wrong, but can also seen, be seen positively. It strikes me as a very similar exercise philosophically and uh, narratologically to what she does in, say, the life of William Cavendish or the life of Margaret Cavendish. That, that there's a kind of exercise of biography, a biographical depiction of scenes in the life of her husband, William Cavendish, who who is not a hero when he comes out of, of the Civil War, he's, he's not seen positively at all by the English, requires a kind of apologetics, requires a kind of view uh, on both sides of, of the equation. 
and a kind of understanding that that um, actions have goods and bads. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. Oh, Lisa, make sure you unmute again. Um, yeah, uh, this is a discussion that's been going on for a long time, whether she favored monarchy or a Republican form of government. And Lisa Hopkins and I have discussed this at length. I, that's a very interesting excerpt from nature's picture uh, pictures and I think that it's certainly true she's following something she does all through her work which is presenting opposing points of view uh, without necessarily uh, saying which is better I think she's a monarchist but that's beside the point uh, 1654 uh, she's in exile in, I guess she's in maybe Paris at that point. I don't know if she's in Antwerp yet. Uh, but her husband is being, uh, wants to be very much part of the inner circle in the exile. And he's being nosed out by other people who are part of the exile community. So, and you know, she really has experienced the corruption of um, favorites in the orbit of the king, uh, the uncrowned Charles II, and she really knows how that works. So she is very dubious about how forms of government should be, but rather governing in either form is what's crucial. You have to get rid of the corruption, the corrupting influences and have a government that works. And I should add, by the way, she's also responding to Thomas Hobbes in that um, as well, but maybe I shouldn't go at length about that. Yeah, Leviathan came out in 1651. That's really helpful, Lisa. Thank you so, so much. Um, Diana, Brian, did you guys want to follow up on any of Tanya's questions or shall we move on? To th those, were, those were tough, Tanya, come on, be nicer. No, I'm kidding. Um, but shall, shall we, um, I think we have a few people in the chat and maybe a few people on the list. E? Yeah, uh, so we have a question. Um, how can we strike a balance between studying natural theology and studying the life history of insects? What kind of statement is sufficient to represent the life history of an individual? Which I think is really fascinating. Well, maybe I'll take a stab uh, at that. I mean, the, the people I study rarely um, studied the life history of an individual. Um, they were studying, you know, Rarely they would get one specimen, it was unique, they would follow through what happened to it. Um, Huda received uh, by way of the um, French ambassador to the Netherlands, a butterfly that was taken in Paris, um, I think in the uh, Bois de Vincennes, um, in the hopes that he would be able to identify um, the kind of caterpillar that it came from, he failed in that. But you know, largely they would raise um, many different kinds of the same insect. Marian describes that in her uh, 1679 book, um, you know, how she would study the insect for years, um, collecting them, watching how they developed. Um, and by the early 18th century, the French academician Julien Muro had kind of systematized that. Um, and um, there's a, a wonderful book um, by Mary Terrell called uh, Catching Nature in the Act, which looks at Reimer's practices, but he would have hundreds of um, caterpillars that he would let pupate and then hang up in the hopes that, you know, when they did transform themselves into butterflies, he would be there. Um, part of doing this work, um, if you're trying to follow the life cycle of an insect, um, you know, either you can spend all of your time there watching it, or you can just have so many of them that there's a good chance that you'll see each important event at the time. That also lets you determine what the ordinary outcome is and how much variation there is in it. So I don't think it's so much uh, representing the life cycle of an individual as it is uh, of a species, um, a term which is just gaining technical precision at the time. Um, and, um, you know, additionally, 
you know, even someone like Swammerdam was even less concerned with individual species than with broad patterns of transformation. So Swammerdam believed that he could reduce all insect transformations to four different types. Um, and that was the basis that John Ray used um, when Ray turned late in life to the classification of insects as well. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that um, you know, natural theology is often given as a justification for the study of insects. Um, it might not even be necessarily um, a real justification, but it's a, it's a polite way to explain how you can be interested in insects, um, which seem to be these trivial, sometimes nasty, um, obnoxious creatures. Um, and it's not just um, non-naturalists who say that. One of the things that the Comte de Buffon did, the author of the great uh, French natural history of the second half of the 18th century, is you know he condemned Reymer because Reymer spent far too much time on insects, which are these insignificant little creatures. And Buffon was going to study the real animals, um, you know, not these insects, um, which didn't deserve attention. He clearly never met a Goliath bird eating. Um, what was it, Diana? That is going to haunt my dreams. Yeah, a Goliath bird-eating tarantula. <laughs> yeah, um, for, a for a long time, people didn't believe Marianne's depiction yeah, of that. Yeah, that's um, right. It was, it was cited as an example that she was a credulous woman. Yeah. I was just going to add to that uh, just quickly. It, it, very interesting in the insects of Suriname how kind of deliberately vague Marian is about her collection practices and about her methodology. Um, we do know, of course, that she was, you know, observing very closely uh, the metamorphoses when she was back home, but we don't know very much really about how she was going about this in Suriname. That's why I think actually those plates. 36 uh, and 45 are really interesting because you can actually see where she's mentioning the servants, the people who are helping her in collection. Um, when I attended the, there was a Maria Sibylla Marian conference a, a few years ago in Amsterdam and there was a, one of these British TV personality explorers, um, Redmond Hamlin, and he had a very compelling uh, sort of way of describing it. And he had said, you have to kind of picture her like in all her like, you know, 17th century garments and skirts with no support Court, you know, ha hacking through the jungle or servants hacking in front of her in the, in the jungle. And he said something like you would, um, she would have uh, encountered a scorpion on every 11th leaf. Mm -hmm. So you could, the, that kind of uh, intensity in the collection and in the actual observation and how did she actually manage to observe those insects in their metamorphoses, you know, in Suriname is I think deliberately elided in the text. So uh, so that's really interesting and very different from the 1679 text. Um, Martina had a hand. Um, do you want to follow on that? Yeah, I think it's connected. I mean, you may partly have answered it already, but I was interested in her awareness and almost sometimes it's like foregrounding the violence involved in, you know, the, both the colonial enterprise and in natural history itself. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have in Margaret Cavendish, you have some denouncing of human violence to animals as well. Um, but I was just wondering in, in Marion how you would sum up her attitude towards that violence, of course, she's implicated in it in some ways and yet she brings it out. I, I found it hard to kind of read her attitude towards it. Yeah, I think that's pretty deliberate too. Uh, I haven't been able to figure out what her attitude is towards it. I, I think it's a very, and that's try, was what I was trying to get at in the paper that there's this always this tension between that kind of ecosystemic model or the symbiosis of the composition of the plate itself and, um, and you know, the elision of that kind of colonial violence in the actual text, right? So as a literary scholar, that's something that we're looking for, right? We're trying to tease that out. Um, a historian might look at that a little bit differently. So I don't know, Brian, you wanna pick that up? Well, you know, I, I, I won't, Speak to that um, in terms of the colonial violence there, um, which you've addressed fairly uh, effectively, Diana. But you know, one thing that I think a more general change in sensibility we need to be aware of that affects not only Marianne but her contemporaries, they really do not seem to have any moral qualms about killing insects. Um, and um, you know, that persists in some way down to the present. There are people who would be horrified at killing a mouse who think nothing of um, you know, swatting a fly. Um, insects are not prototypical animals, you know, to use Lakoff and Johnson's prototype theory, you know, they're not charismatic megafauna. Um, and so, you know, we put them in a somewhat different category, but 
you know, it's even more pronounced for the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, convinced Charles Darwin that there could not be a loving, uh, all-powerful God is the um, uh, ichneumon wasp parasitism of other insects, the phenomena that Martin Lister discovered and that Swammerdam explored, where you know, a, a wasp will lay its eggs in a living caterpillar. Um, the eggs will then hatch and eat the caterpillar from the inside out, um, avoiding the vital organs as long as possible. Um, and so the caterpillar becomes food for the wasp larvae, which then pupate either inside it or outside it, um, and then turn into the adult insects. And if you have tomato hornworms in your garden, um, you may have run across um, a caterpillar dead with um, dozens of little egg sacs, um, cocoons outside, or cocoons rather, outside of it. Um, you know, that's an example of that phenomenon. Darwin was horrified by this. And how could a loving God do this? None of my 17th century uh, historical subjects who studied this seem to have had the least qualm about it. And the physical theologians actually even said, well, isn't this a great example? God sends these wasps to parasitize caterpillars and keep them from, you know, overwhelming our, our crops and devouring everything. Um, you know, it's a very Pollyanna-ish world, the world of the physico theologian. Um, you know, Dr. Pangloss is not too exaggerated, it seems, in some regards. But, you know, this, the sensibility about killing insects and e even about the way in which they kill one another is just, um, they have no problems with that uh, at all. I mean, is that, a, is that a kind of generic feature like, uh, of the genre, I mean, uh, of maybe the historia or of um, th that kind of observational report that's already there? It sounds like right now you're inferring it's it's more in the, in the attitudes and the mores of the people do not necessarily have that emotional regret or that kind of but in the Marion painting or um, illustration that you shared of the, the the rose that's been kind of eaten by a cankered um, a little mm -hmm. caterpillar that just kind of pokes its head out and then destroys the thing um, but also in some of the comments that um, Alice was sharing with us before the bio break about um, was it Titus Andronicus Alice is that the the one it's always this kind of metaphor of the, the insect coming to like ruin good things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and Cavendish gives us a kind of different read on that when she talks, you know, the butcher and the fly having this debate about whether the decay of, of life is ultimately the more regenerative. And it's almost this kind of utilitarian calculus about, well, who gives more life in the end? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I guess I'm coming back to my question, that emotional kind of aloofness from the rot, the decay, the sadness, the death, is that, uh, do we back read objectivity on that or do we do we register that as just kind of a trait of the genre what what are, what are our options um do you think well i'll say a couple words and then give the floor to others i think there's a certain degree of paradox um and this is something janice neary points out that insects are both beautiful at least some of them and carriers of destruction um and one of the things that both um insect illustrations and flower illustrations did was to preserve um, for eternity, or at least for the long haul, um, fleeting things that passed away very quickly and some of which were themselves destructive. Uh, and so I don't think it's necessarily objectivity, not even aloofness. I mean, there's one final example and then I'll, I'll turn it over. The, in the um, La Puce de Madame des Roches, um, this, uh, series of poems published in the late 16th century. Oh, uh, wow. uh, you know, the, um, the subject, um, yeah, it's about a, a, a louse found um, on the décolletage of a young woman um, in a salon um, in uh, uh, Tours, I think, um, and I'm not positive. In any case, the location doesn't matter. Um, you know, she's, thank you, Poitiers, uh, the bonjour. Um, uh, she is praised for the dexterity with which she picks up and dispatches this louse, um, which is an everyday event. You know, people had lice uh, and you needed to be good at getting rid of them, um, or at least it was, it was a skill. Um, no sympathy for the louse, oh, sorry, for the flea, right? So, okay, hi everybody. I just wanted to jump in. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat and then I wanted to open it up for anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask any questions. Uh, Jonathan had asked a while back about um, actually returning to the Cavendish and asking about um, the sort of literary influences um, that might have informed her position 
on insects. Um, and he, of course, brings up the uh, catalog that we have of the library auction. Um, and he asked specifically about a theater of political flying insects by Samuel Purchase. And I didn't know uh, if any of our historians wanted to chime in or anyone who knows uh, a bit more about some of the uh, liter or the natural philosophical influences that might have impacted Cavendish's view of insects. Jonathan, I can jump in briefly. I, I don't know about Sam Purchase. It's very possible. Um, I, I have a piece forthcoming that uh, has to do with the Virginian colonist, um, uh, Virginia Farrar, who was a sericulturist, so a, a, a silkwormer. And she uh, publishes through Samuel Hartlib. She's, she's praised uh, in 1655 for her, her new inventions and her new kind of observations on silkworms. And Cavendish seems to, to pick up a really relevant new detail about silkworms laying their eggs kind of about them and then building a cocoon around themselves. Um, and that seems to become a really important metaphor for, and it actually references bottoms as heuristic metaphors for other complex phenomena like light or the slimy part of the earth or something like that. That becomes a big um, element and it shows up again in the grounds of natural philosophy in the appendix when she starts imagining this creature at the center of the center of the world that's got these restoring beds or wombs. For all of you who aren't Cavendishians, this is, go read it and, and uh, maybe smoke something um, <laughs> illicit doing it. It's the best experience you could possibly have. Um, but maybe we'll save that for the fancy seminar next week. But it, it, the, the cocoon metaphor of the silkworm that kind of keeps auto-generating is, is kind of fantastic. Um, as far as I, that's all I've been able to kind of say, like almost absolutely certainly she read that. Um, beyond that, she is hard to pin down, I'll be perfectly honest. Is it, um, so, so she knows something about silkworms that you think she must have gotten from this thing published in 1655, that's the idea? Yeah, just because she doesn't have any other observations of silkworms qua observation of silkworms. Um, she might have read Moffat, I don't know. Moffat is a possibility as well. Yeah. Um, although he gets that detail wrong. So that's why there's reason to <laughs> yeah. think. There's almost, there's almost no natural history in English in the catalog. Um, almost all of it is, well, a lot of what there is is published uh, after she was writing. Um, and the only thing on insects, as far as I can tell, is this Sam Purchase thing. Uh, and if you just look at its table of contents, he seems to be rather impressed with bees. Um, so I wonder if she's, you know, read some of that. Um, but when did, so you, you have a forthcoming thing? What is, can you tell I'll, us more I'll about it? it? I'll, sh I'll shoot it to you down the road if it makes it through the next okay. couple of stages. How about that? Okay. Um, e, do you want to take it back up? Well, yeah, I mean, and most of our questions have been um, kind of answered as we were going. Sophie has brought up a couple of interesting connections between, um, of course, the zombie army um, in the blazing world and the idea of um, a wasp taking over um, a caterpillar, which I thought was a really interesting connection that was pretty relevant. Uh, and she's also brought up the idea of Dunn, right? So we know that um, Cavendish was was reading Dunn and thinking about him. So she suggested the, the poem about the flea. Um, and then Jonathan had also asked about um, Aesop's fables and any influence. I've always seen that influence as being pretty obvious, but I didn't know if uh, other folks have written or read more about that and would like to chime in. She's yeah. clearly in. She's clearly influenced or has read Aesop, 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 uh, that's clear. In she, it. she directly and, references um, Aesop in her, in the true, true relations. So she makes very clear that Aesop was part of her education. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. She also has an unfinished farce um, that is supposed to be appended to the, the blazing world where she has characters like um, Good Wife Silkworm and Dig the Worm Man which seems to be kind of based off of a, a more of a Ben Johnson bent where you have these animal characters like the fox bull pony. Um, so that Aesop through Johnson, you know, there's a lot of different ways we get there. Sir Puppy Dog Man, thank you, Liza. I was actually just gonna ask Liza, this just intuitively seems like something you would know things about. Do you wanna chime in? Yeah, so uh, my colleague Katie Santos and I uh, published a collection of Renaissance fable translations, at the heart of which is the Golden Moral Fable Talk, sort of emblematic fable translation. But one of the things we found that might be useful to insert here is that um, unlike an author like Virgil or Ovid, where by the late 15th century, they had a fairly stable idea of what that text was. Um, 
Aesop is just sort of a cloud of related texts and people take a lot more liberty in translating Aesop. So if she's reading the sort of core 52 very short Latin translations that were the start of every sort of school boys curriculum in the 16th century, then she has a very different Aesop than if she's reading Ogilby's long paraphrastic translations where he's embellishing all this detail. Um, so yeah, I mean, to some extent, it, she so rarely cites her sources that it's useful for her to say she to directly cite an author like that, but it's also not useful because which Aesop she got, there were lots of very, very different sort of Aesop source texts that were circulating by the mid 17th century, even just in English. Um, so I just made it worse, not better, sorry. Uh, no, that's, that's helpful and fantastic and um, helps fill in the gaps for those of us who don't know as much about the print history. And um, I, our, our introduction to that volume is on academia.edu. So if anyone wants to get, we have a very sort of quick two page summary of every, every one we could find that was in English in the period. So you can nab it from academia if you're interested. Um, we're running, I believe we're closing at five, right Arno? Yeah, that, that's right. Yes. Do we have any last questions? Any last comments from somebody maybe who yeah, had a chance to, to speak up? Anyone who's been quiet, who wants this moment to get in a last I grand thought? Yes. I do want to point out, uh, David Cunning um, has kind of chimed in on the natural theology uh, question, um, discussing sort of the lack of moral good or bad in nature, nature being nature. Um, I didn't know, David, if you wanted to explain a bit more or make a comment. So I, I just didn't want to talk too much. I wanted to just mention in the chat some okay. possible things that Cavendish might say. Okay. And then we also have the question about uh, top cell. So do we know, and I know um, for those of us, um, the catalog and, and Laura Dodds's work, um, but if anybody's familiar with whether or not um, Cavendish had the 1650s edition of top cell. Brian says it is extant in English. Yeah. I don't know whether Cavendish owned it. Yeah. Maybe someone doesn't look like it's in the catalog. Yeah, it's not it's not in the natural histories of English section of the catalog. I haven't checked every section for it yet. The real question is, does Maria Sibylla Marion have a copy of The Blazing World in her library? <laughs> we'll have to have I an don't... option for that one uh, to find out. Or maybe Brian will discover that or Diana in the next few weeks. Who knows? Lisa? Yeah. I don't think she read English. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think she read English. That's my comment. <laughs> but. Well, um, a big thank you from all of us. From some, A yeah, big thank you to Sophia and Raya and Martine for being our, our fantastic moderators. To all of you for coming out. Um, we do have another uh, Olio webinar next Friday, which will be led by Sophia. But you'll see similar faces once more on Fancy and the Imagination. Hopefully, many of you will be there. And uh, if not, please feel free to sign up on the wait list. And um, it's been absolutely lovely having all of your thoughts and all of your opinions. Do uh, reach out to Brian or to Diana or to me. Um, our, our email addresses are going up hopefully in the, in the chat right now. Um, and uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll stay on for a few minutes if anybody has remaining questions, but obviously I, I won't ask the same of any of you. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you for taking your time, especially the Australians, the Tasmanians, the those in Taiwan, those in the UK. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you. thank you, everyone. We hope to see you next week. Um, thank you. David Cunning will be speaking. It's going to be awesome. And then also Maura Smith, um, who's not here today, but she's got some really exciting stuff in the works. And you get to talk more about fancy as gnats and other gross things. So I was going to say, fairies and gnats are fancies, and I am curious to hear about the connection. And worlds, worlds and worlds and worlds. So um, yeah, so we're really excited. Email me with questions, comments, concerns, technological problems. Um, I have a tiny amendment to make thanks to Liza, who has sent me straight in my non-bookish ways. Um, so, But if you're signed up, you'll get that email shortly. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming. We hope to see you next week or the week after when E is going to be running a session on education and access and women's um, sort of ability to, to partake in the time and then also pedagogy. Okay.
thank you so yeah. thank you thanks everyone and we will make the chat available to everyone soon. we'll be back in touch when we've got all our materials collected thank you great thanks everyone take care and nice to see you again lisa <laughs> thank you <laughs>